Do you have your Bible? Take it and turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, very quickly, I want you to see something very quick. I have left a blank in the title once again for you. Did that last week, did that this week. Again, take out your notes, take out a pen. You're going to need it, and I'm going to share this with you. This last summer, Marcy and I had the privilege of going to see her family in New Mexico. We had landed in Albuquerque. We're driving across from Albuquerque up toward the northeast toward a town called Taos in the, in the New Mexican Rockies. And as we were driving along, and I know that you all have experienced this before, have you ever been driving along and you look off to the side and you get just a, a snapshot image where it was in focus, it was in view, you got it, and it, it was an image that just stuck in your mind? Have you ever done that before? Maybe, maybe of a person or maybe a tree or maybe a sign or something like that. In an instant, you're running along 60, 65 miles an hour and you look over to the side and you just have this perfect picture. That's exactly what happened to me this summer. As I was driving along and we were zipping through a little town um, there on the lower part of the Rockies and I looked and I saw a church that was sitting there, kind of a beautiful, modern-looking church right up there near the highway. And over their main entrance, over their main entrance was this statement. In words, above the doors, and it's a statement I've seen before and heard before, but this one got burned in my mind as soon as I saw it. And it's the title of our message today, and here it is. Our mission, fill it in, is the Great Commission. Our mission is the Great Commission. Now, some of you are saying, what is the Great Commission? Well, we're going to read it. But I thought it was so beautiful that this church put above their door, if you want to know what a mission of our church is, if you want to know what our church is about, our church is about the last huge instructions that Jesus came, gave before he left. And here it is. We find it. And in fact, I want to ask you, how many chapters are in the book of Matthew? So that means if we're in Matthew chapter 28, we're in what? The last chapter. The book of Matthew, for those of you who are new to the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are what we call the four Gospels. And those four Gospels outline the life of Jesus. Um, they, they basically start... At the beginning of his life, three of them tell his birth. One of them leads out his birth, says that, okay, we know, we, we know that he was born. The others covered that, so I'm going to cover this aspect. But they all begin within the first chapter or two with his ministry. So his ministry begins, and then these gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they tell the story of Jesus' life, and then at the end of each one of these gospels, we see a very similar message. We see a very similar trend, which makes sense because they're all telling basically the same story. But look with me. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus has already died on the cross. He's risen from the dead. He's appeared to more than 500. He tells them, he tells his disciples to go meet him. It's very important. And they don't know why, but now look with me in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 16. It says, now the 11 disciples, now why the 11? You said, I thought there was 12. Who are we missing at this point? <laughs> Judas. Judas has betrayed the Lord and then committed suicide. And so in all, of his, in all of his betrayal of God, he knew who Jesus was, but yet he rejected him, and his end was destruction. But look in verse 16. Now the 11 disciples went to where? Galilee, that's up in the north, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. So Jesus had told them to go there, verse 17. And when they saw him, I love it, when they saw him, they what? They worshiped him. That's a good thing to do when you see the Lord. Some of you are seeing the Lord right now for the first time in your life that he has, been, he has begun to bring you to himself and he's begun to reveal himself to you in through different ways and sometimes through good things or sometimes through hard things. But you're beginning to see and hear his voice. Let me tell you that when these people saw the Lord, they worshiped him. That's a good thing for anyone to do. Verse 17, but some doubted. Look at verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, 
and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Today, when we saw baptism, it was in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit that Tiago was laid down in the water and then raised. Look what it says there in verse 20. Teaching them to observe, circle the word, all. This is a very powerful point for us. We don't just teach a little bit, we teach all of it. And one guy in the church said, yeah, but pastor, not all in one Sunday, please. I understand. We, we, we don't have to study it all in one Sunday, but, but we need to be careful as a church to teach the whole gospel, to teach all of the gospel, to be careful to look at God's Word. You see, it's, the, the smorgasbord Christianity is a very alive and well. You say, what is that? Well, that's, that's the same thing as buffet Christianity, where you just go and get the things that you like. Consumer-driven Christianity. You know, what do the people want to hear? But that's not what Jesus said. In verse 19 and 20, he says, go and make disciples. And the way that you make disciples is that you teach them to observe, that means to obey, all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is called, right out there to the side, for those of you who maybe are new students to the Bible, right out there to the side, the Great Commission. This was where Jesus commissions his people, all who are going to follow him. This is where he gives us our mission. So what is so interesting about this is that we see this throughout the story of Christ. Now, our church has four core values, and this is a great opportunity for us to say this, and um, our starting point people that are in starting point right now, we went over this just last week, and so hopefully they're going to be able to shout these out with me. But we have four core values in the life of our church. And do you remember what they are? The first one is truth. We must hold on to the truth of God. The second one is worship. We need to be people who worship God. And that's not just on Sunday morning, but it is 168 hours a week. We need to be a church that when we're at home, when we're at work, when we're having fun, or when we're going through difficulties, that we are a people who worship God. Now, I, and it also does have to do with Sunday morning. The church gathered is an incredibly important part of Christian worship and Christian life. So truth, worship, community. God has not made Lone Ranger Christians. He has not made us to be individualistic. The American wealth and the American ideals of very much an individualistic life, people who can live next door to each other and never interact, people who, as time goes on, we have less and less interaction, even with our own families. We have the wealth to move away from one another. We have the wealth to build fences. We have the wealth to live lives of our own entertainment and everything else. We, we tend to be being isolated more and more and more and more. And what's very interesting is that the anti-social media software that we use for exposing us to one another more, we know one another less. We relate to one another less. And so this is anti-God. You say, you mean Facebook is anti-God? Well, it doesn't have to be, but it can be. And with it, when it exalts self or when it exalts in us even an individualistic mentality where we are not truly entering in, in real community, that is very toxic to human life. And so there's a third one, or a fourth one here that's very important to us, and it's, what what is the last one that is here? Mission. I heard a few of you say that. So um, fill in the word mission, and I want us to say these four out loud together, very strong. Please don't make us do it twice. So um, go ahead. If if you're not strong, we're going to do it till we leave, but uh, let's try to do it strong. I want you to understand that these are important concepts for Sheridan Hills. These are things that we cannot let go of. In fact, we can't let go of one of them. I want you to imagine a table that is here with four legs on each corner. And if we were to just say, ah, let's undo one of these and throw it away. And then you come around and you sit on the table, what's going to happen? It's going down. 
This is a, these are four pillars or these are four legs that a church must be built upon and any one of them missing will destroy the church. And that may be surprising for you on mission. You say, well, can't the church operate without mission? Can't you just hold on to truth, worship, and community? And I mean, is mission really critical? Let me tell you that mission is absolutely critical to the health of a church. The churches who give up on mission are churches who die. That is simply the way it is. If we go away from mission and just go to maintenance, we die. And this, we've seen this through 2,000 years. Let's say all four of these words together. Truth, worship, community, mission. Any one of these are absolutely critical within themselves to the overall success of the Christian life. You see, our mission is, fill it in, our mission is the Great Commission, and it is given to us not by Peter, and it's not given by Paul, and it's not given by the church as a whole or a group of cardinals or something like that. The church as a mission is given to us by the one who bought the church with his own blood, our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's a few things that are important to note here. The first bullet point is final instructions are usually very, very important. Have you ever noticed that? Final instructions are very, very important. When you see your kids going out and they're, you know, they're going on a trip or you're, you're leaving behind the babysitter and they're going to be doing their thing and everything, you turn around and you look at them and you, you make sure that everything is stated that's, that's really important. And sometimes some of those most important things are said, you say it at the very end to make sure they remember it, right? You ever done that before? I mean, you, you go back and you repeat it again just as you're leaving to make sure that nobody messes it up, right? Well, in a small way, we see that tendency throughout life, but we also see it through the gospel. Jesus is making very clear as he leaves that the Great Commission is very important, that we are to go and to tell and to go and to make disciples. Look at the next bullet point here. These final instructions substantiate all of Jesus's other instructions. They substantiate everything he said. When Jesus says, go and make disciples, go to the ends of the earth, until I come back, you go tell other human beings what I've done. When he tells us that, he is saying, I want you to teach all that I have, I have commanded you. You see, that picture is that it is saying, everything I've said to you is important. I, it's, it's, don't leave, don't take it, it, bits and pieces, give everything that I've said. Look at the third one that is there, and I've left it filled in. The final instructions are found throughout all four Gospels and the book of Acts. The final instructions are found all through the, the Gospels. Now, don't flip your sheet over yet. Look at these verses that are right there. In Mark, how many chapters are in Mark? 16. At the end of Mark, look what Jesus says. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. Now, the idea of him saying, switching over, not just to people, but to all of creation is this. Jesus is making, and this is so indicative of Mark's recording of this, Jesus is saying, don't leave anyone out. The group that you think is kind of small, I'm telling you, preach my message of truth to everything, everyone. What he's saying is don't leave out any people groups. Look at the next part, Luke chapter 24, verses 46 through 48. And he said to them, thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins, underline it, should be what? Circle the word proclaimed. Should be proclaimed in his name again. You see the little word, all. All nations, beginning from Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. So he's saying you start where you are and you go to every nation. We're going to see what that means. Look at John chapter 21. Here at the end of the book of John, Jesus says to them, 
Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Now this is, if you look at John, this is right there in these final days of Jesus' life. There's still another chapter that is here, but here we see that this is the end of John's gospel. And then at Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, we see at the beginning of the early of the church, we see this picture as that transition goes from Jesus' life to the life of the church, the bride of Christ. We see Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come, up, come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, look what it says, in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the end of the earth. All the, all the peoples of the earth are to hear the gospel of Christ not just the people of Jerusalem. Flip your sheet over and look with me. You see, we are to go and make disciples both locally, fill it in, and globally. We are to go and make disciples locally and globally. We are to go to the person next door and we are to go to the person 12 time zones away and everybody in between. Christians are not called to only sit and to receive and to soak what they have uh, been given for themselves. Christians are to call to go and to make disciples. Look what it says in this next bullet point. God uses us to share the good news of Christ with those who do not know him near and far. Acts 1.8 says, to the end of the earth. Not only that, but look at the next bullet point. He also tells us the job is not done until his good news is proclaimed everywhere, to every people group, to every group of people. Look what it says in Matthew chapter 24. Uh, Matthew chapter 24 is where Jesus describes what is going to happen toward the end of this age, and it does have to do with all kinds of cataclysmic events and the, the rampage of sin upon human hearts where our love grows cold and we become more violent and we become more hostile and less loving. We see that happening around us, no doubt about it, but look at Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. And this gospel, Jesus is speaking, and he says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world, underline that, throughout the whole world, as a testimony to what? All nations, we keep seeing that phrase, all nations, and then the end will come. And so that is not something that Christians need to be afraid of, Christians can rejoice in, because when Christ is king of our hearts and with the promises that he has made, we can rejoice that he has a good plan for his glory and our good. Now, the nations of the world, this is what we keep saying. In fact, in the uh, box at the top of your page right there on the back side where it says, in verse 19, it says, go therefore and make disciples of what? All nations. Over and over and over again, we see this idea of all nations. This is something that's critical for Christians to understand. All nations is said in Greek, ta ethne, and you hear a word in there, ethne, like ethnic group. Well, what does that mean? Where does that come from? What does it, what does it really signify? Ta ethne means all nations, all peoples. And we see this throughout the Old Testament and throughout the New Testament that God's glory is going to be known by every group of people on the earth. And when it is all said and done, when everything is finished and this world has been made new, the picture is this, that men and women from every tribe and every tongue and every nation are going to be worshiping God as those who have been made his children, made his family. Now, this is not, all nations is not, this is important to understand, is not talking about geopolitical nations. This is so exciting to preach on a Sunday like this. <laughs> so exciting. I love it. We don't, even, nobody's in a hurry to go anywhere. It's pouring outside. So this is great. We can have fun. Okay, so just, just notice this. We're not talking about geopolitical nations. We're not talking about the uh, Amer United States of America and France and Venezuela and Colombia. We're not talking about these boundaries. That's not what it is. We're not talking about countries. We're not talking about geopolitical nations or countries is the other way that we say it. When Jesus is speaking of, of this, he is speaking much, much different than that. He is talking about various 
people groups or groups of people, people groups. And when you get around missionaries now, you hear a lot of talk about different people groups. And we need to, we need to understand this. What is a people group? Notice this. A group of people who have a common sense of four things. A common sense of history. They all know where they came from together. A common sense of language. They speak the same language. That's very important. You know, language really divides. When you don't understand somebody's, uh, somebody's language, how many people in this room speak Chinese? Does anybody speak Chinese in here? I, I don't see one person that speaks Chinese. Maybe one or two this, this morning. That it, most of us do not speak Chinese. If somebody got up here and they started speaking Chinese and they started telling all about their family and all about their life and everything else, we would all do what? Oh, that's not, somebody said leave. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, maybe you would. I hope you wouldn't be that rude. Um, but but we, was, we certainly wouldn't understand what they're saying. You know, language is a divider. I mean, when you can't, I mean, there's things that you can do. You know, you can do charades and everything, but that only goes so far. You certainly can't deal with heart issues very easily um, when it comes to that. But so history, language, beliefs, people with common beliefs. You heard the the, the young people describing different Hindu beliefs, different Buddhist beliefs, different Islamic beliefs that they were watching, that they were encountering, seeing being played out. And a personal sense of identity. So these four things are, are very much part of this. Notice the next part here. The difference, this is the difference between us versus them. This is the thing that makes Puerto Ricans say, well, you know, we're, we're like this over here, and we may speak the same language as Dominicans, but we actually are a little bit different. There are some things about us that are different. I know that you gringos think we're all the same, but we're not. Dominicans are different than Puerto Ricans, and they're different than Mexicans, and they're different from Colombians. And even though they have the same language, they have a different culture, they have different ways in which they, they have a different sense of history, they have, there, there's really, and then you throw in that whole thing of <clears throat> the Portuguese or Brazilians, and there's not only a different language, but there, again, there's another layer of differences. So they may kind of look similar, but they actually are very, very different. Yes, I need that. Thank you. <clears throat> so this, notice the map that's in front of you. Pakistan is one country, Okay. We, we, you can look at Pakistan, and we've all kind of learned that Pakistan's up there by Afghanistan, Central Asia. Been a lot of different things that have happened over the last 20 years in the Middle East as a result of 9-11 um, and all these things. Pakistan, we, we kind of think of that as one nation. But anyone who has served either in Afghanistan or in Pakistan, notice the next part. They are one nation with 400 different people groups. Like the difference between Dominicans and Puerto Ricans, and that, that may be actually kind of not a real good example because they are, they are sharing the same language. In Pakistan, you can have radically different languages. 400 different people groups. Those different people groups is what Jesus is talking about when he says people from every tribe and every tongue, every dialect, and every ethnicity, every nation are to hear the gospel. Now, this is a difficult thing. How many people groups are there? This is a good thing for Christians to understand. Christians need to see that there are about 16,000 different people groups in the world that make up the 195 countries of the world. So we have about 100 and, uh, 195 countries, but in those 195 countries, there's 16, not 16,000 people, 16,000 people groups that are, have a different sense of identity. And this is the idea of us versus them. Notice the next part here. How many people groups have access to hearing the gospel 
in their culture. So if we have 16,000 people groups, of that 16,000, how many of them have the gospel? And we would say about 9,000 of them have the gospel. You say, well, that's, that's good. Seems like it's more than half. That's, that's good. You see, these people are the people that we would say they live in a culture where they can hear the gospel um, within their language, within their environment in which they live, and there's someone in their people group that has come to faith in Jesus who can tell them the gospel. Now, do you think America is considered a reached people group or an unreached people group? You say, well, we're, you say, well they're, we're so pagan, we see all these terrible things happening. No, but, li- but listen to this. How many of you drove past another church to get here this morning? How many of you drove past another church? Practically every one of us. And you know what the, the amazing thing is? As careful as Sheridan Hills is trying to be about our theology and our church life, there are many other churches that are very close to us that are preaching the gospel and love Jesus. We're not the only ones. In fact, there's many that are around. Right down the street is T.J. Campo in St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church. And sure, they dunk babies, or they sprinkle babies and all that kind of thing. Little dabble, do you? And we have a different (laughs) view on baptism in that regard, and that's significant to me. But, you know, T.J. loves the Lord, and he's preaching the gospel. And there's others that are... All across South Broward area, North Miami, there, there are others who are preaching the gospel. There, there's a lot of places that people can go. In fact, you can turn on your radio, and how many Christian radio stations can you listen to here in South Florida? How many? Somebody, I saw Deborah Cadovius. She's saying three. I've thought it's three. Uh, I think it's about three. And, and that's not even to mention, just in English and in American context, all of the Internet coverage that is available to us and things that are readily accessible to us. You see, we're one of those people where the gospel is readily available to us that there are Christians that are here. But notice the next question. How many people groups have no access to hearing the gospel in their culture? How many people groups have no access to hearing the gospel in their culture? And the number on that is a staggering 7,000 people groups. And they have what we would call little to no access. And I want to define that. You see, there's, there's just not Christians readily identifiable in their culture. I'm not saying that there wouldn't be a Christian there, but they just, if you, if you sat, if you woke up in the morning and you heard God's voice saying, believe in Jesus Christ, you don't know where to go. You're not sure where to go, where, where can I find one of those Christians. Then, then we're starting to identify unreached people groups. And so fill this in here and notice here how many of those people groups have no access to hearing the gospel in their culture? 7,000. These are called UPGs. Can you see, can you say UPGs with me? Say that. UPG. And what does UPG stand for except for unreached people groups? This means that less than 2% of the population knows Jesus. Less than 2% of their entire group know who Jesus is. There may be missionaries, you see that my statement here is, there may be missionaries or other various organizations who are working among them, but folks, there are 3 billion people that live in the context of our world that do not have Christianity down the street from them. They do not drive past 20 churches to go to their church. They can't turn on the radio and just hear Christian programming um, available in their language. So those people groups, are. You, you even heard Alex say that the people group that they were just going to were the people group named the Soli people. The Bible is not in their language except for portions of the New Testament and very little of the Old Testament. It hasn't even been translated into their language. Now, friends... With as many Americans and Brits and Europeans and South American Christians as there are, to me, it breaks my heart that there are 7,000 people groups that have no access to the gospel. 
That is wrong. That is, that is, that is unthinkable that we have people groups, whole people groups, hundreds of thousands at a time, that do not have the gospel available to them. While we sit in such a luxurious place, and ours isn't even as luxurious as some. While we live in the homes that we live and do the things that we do and go and experience all that we experience, when there's 7,000 people groups that are dying in their sin because no one has showed up and learned their language and simply said, we're here to tell you that you don't have to die in your sin. You don't have to die and go to hell. When Jesus told us, over and over and over again throughout the course of his ministry this is important I have come and given my life for you now live your life to tell others that I have died so that they can live and we're afraid to be embarrassed we're afraid that somebody will say something to, about us on Facebook we're afraid that somebody will reject us we're afraid that somebody will in some way sneer at us We're afraid that somebody will ask a question that we can't answer when the issue is eternal weight of glory versus condemnation. I believe that Christians need to look at that number of three billion people that do not have access to the gospel, and we need to be very, very concerned. Okay, here's the next amazing thing. Of those 7,000 people groups that we, are, that we call, or what, what do we call them? UPGs. What does UPG stand for? Unreached people group. That means less than what percentage of them know Jesus? Can everybody say two? Less than 2% of them know Jesus. So those are UPGs. Of those 7,000 UPGs, listen to this, 3,000 of those 7,000 are called U-U-P-G's. And what does U-U-P-G mean except this? That they are unengaged, unreached people groups. You know what this means? Nobody's even trying to reach them. There's nobody headed their way getting out of language school. There's no organization that has said, we'll take them. We'll we'll go after them. There's no missionaries living down there just even even just, just trying to get started like we have heard about this morning in Lombok. These are the ones that are out there and nobody has gone on. You say, how can this be? How can this be? Well, we ought to ask ourselves, how can this be? And what do we need to do to change that. This means no churches, no believers, no missionaries, no one engaging them. Friends, I believe that we're going to be held accountable for that. I do believe that Jesus forgives our sin. He makes us ready for heaven. I believe that that's true. But I believe that we also are going to be held accountable for being obedient to what is called the great commission or the great command. We need to evaluate our lives. We need to evaluate our Christianity. Do we really believe the gospel? Does Sheridan Hills really burn with the desire to see God glorified around the world? Does it affect the way we live? Does it affect what we do with our time? Does it affect with our plans for the future? Does it interrupt our vacation plans, our retirement plans? Does it affect our finances? Because, you know, a lot of that has to do with missions is money. 
The Apostle Paul had to write about it over and over and over again, telling the early churches, look, I commend you for giving. I commend you for caring. I commend you for doing what you're doing so that the gospel goes forward. As we look at the end of Titus, we're going to see that Paul is saying to the, to the people that are on Crete, saying to Titus, when you see missionaries coming through, you take care of them, you support them, because this is important to God. And there's young men and there's young women in this church that God is saying, give your life to proclaim the gospel so that some of those unreached people groups can come to know that a Savior has died, that I love them. Oswald Smith was a Canadian pastor who this message got a hold of his life. And before he died at the age of 81 years of age, he had traveled to over 100 countries preaching the gospel. And Oswald Smith said this, no one has the right to hear the gospel twice while there remains those who have not heard it once. No one has the right to hear the gospel twice while there remains those who have not heard it once. What if we started to say, Lord, use us. Use us to take the gospel to those who no one is trying, no one is going to. Lord, use my money. Use my time. Use my children. Lord, take my son, take my daughter, that she or he would proclaim the gospel to those who do not know. Lord, take me to proclaim the gospel. You see, I want you to see this. At both the beginning and the end, this is on your outline, at both the beginning and the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, he is saying, follow me. That's what he's saying. Now, I want you to think about what that means. What did Jesus do? Jesus was on mission. Luke chapter 19 and verse 10 says this, that this is the reason that the Son of Man has come, that he might seek and save that which was what? Okay, some of you know what he said. Jesus said, the reason that I've come is to seek and to save. He was on search and rescue. He really was. Savior of the world, to seek and to save that which is lost. We are called to be on search and rescue. We are called to be those who go and obey the call to proclaim the gospel. Jesus was saying, follow me. And in John chapter 21, at the end of John's gospel, here it is, Peter is singled out, and of course Peter has just denied the Lord a few days earlier, and in, in, in fact cursed in the midst of his denying the Lord, um, when Jesus was, he was afraid he was going to be implicated in Jesus' trial. And there, there, was, there was this great failure on Peter's part. But Jesus, in his love, listen to this, Jesus, in his love and in his grace, reaches out to Peter and shows Peter that Peter, even in his failed state of faith, can be invited back to proclaim him as Lord to a lost and dying world. And listen to this, Jesus calls Peter to follow him in dying to self, fill that in, dying to self, that others may know God. And you say, you know, that's what it takes. It requires that we would die to ourselves because as long as we're alive to ourselves, we are not gonna do what it takes. But when we die to ourselves, as Tiago was buried in the waters of baptism today, what he was saying was, I'm dead to myself and I'm alive to Christ. That's what every true Christian professes. I'm dead to myself, I'm dead to sin, and I'm alive to Christ. That's what the Bible shows us. And so we're called to follow Jesus. And Jesus was on a search and rescue mission, and he calls us to join the search and rescue mission with our life. In fact, last statement that's here, I want you to see this. We are never more like Christ. You know, we're called to be like Christ. We're called to be godly. We're called to be like God. But we are never more like Christ than we are when we are living and dying so that others may know God. 
I want you to think about that. Jesus came and he lived, he was born. Don't pack up, don't pack up, don't pack up. Jesus came, he lived, and he, listen, he died so that we could know God. And he said to us that we are to follow him. You say, what a morbid church vision and hope. Oh, listen, no, it's not morbid. It, it, morbid has to do with death. This is, this is the beautiful picture of life. Because Jesus said, unless you're willing to die, you can't live. Notice the screen. There was a man who was named with James Calvert. He was a missionary in the mid-1800s. His picture is right here. He was a British missionary, and he felt called to go to the people of the Fiji Islands, to the cannibals of the Fiji Islands in the Pacific. And so he got together a team, the team had sensed God's call to take the gospel to the Fiji people, and they hailed a ship. They made all of their plans. The ship took them across the world, stopping along the way, and as they got closer to the Fiji Islands, and, you know, back then everything moved slow and everything was a little bit more time. You would stop for a few days here and you'd stop for a few days there, taking on more people or get letting off people or whatever it was. And as they got closer, the captain of the ship came to, John, to Calvert, and he said to him, here's the bottom line, and this is what I'm hearing from everybody else. He said, you will lose your life and the lives of those who are with you if you go among those savages. You know what John Calvert said to him? We died before we came here. We died before we came. Our lives are now hidden with Christ in God. We have died to ourselves. We have died to our life. We have died to our rights. We've died to our pleasures. We've died to this world that has nothing to offer to us. But we live for eternity. We live in Christ. And so the call to take the gospel to the cannibals of Fiji is the call that we are glad to go and to give our lives that others may live. Friends, this is the Great Commission, and it is a brutal calling. But we had a Savior who endured a brutal, de brutal death that we may live. May we live in obedience to his call. Notice the key question. The key question is this. This may be Sheridan Hills' Great Commission, the commission of our Lord, but is it your mission? Is your mission the Great Commission? Is your life in tune with what God has called Christians to do? I want to call you to say yes to the Great Commission. Right where you are, right here in Hollywood, that you would say, Lord, you came and you died. I will die with you that others may live. I will sacrifice all of my wants and all of my desires, and you can have all that I am and all that I am called to do. I give it to you that others may know. Friends, I believe that until our church really, really deals with this issue, I believe that we will be the keepers of the aquarium we're not called to be keepers of an aquarium. We are called to be broken and poured out. We are called to be squeezed out upon a lost and dying world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. May we obey his call to take the gospel to the nations. Amen? Let's pray together.